All right. Thank you so much. Man, I tell you what. There's just a tremendous amount of information that was presented today. I do want to thank you, uh, both both of you, uh, Dr. Ava and Dr. Julia, for the, the information that you provided. It's given us a lot of things to think about. We do have a number of questions uh, in, in the, the chat, and I'm just going to start at the top and work our way down and, and see, see how far we can go uh, before the bottom of the hour. Uh, the first, first question that we have is uh, when did uh, the PFOA, PFOS drinking water regulation study begin? I believe that was uh, uh, in one of the slides that, that they, they started that study. So this is Ava. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I didn't get re-muted. Um, so that's an excellent question. Um, I believe that's in reference to a slide I presented on kind of the regulatory pathway. Um, I don't know exactly when um, PFAS first showed up on the uh, contaminant candidate list, but that CC, um, CCL acronym on the slide, um, that's something a super quick Google search would probably tell you. Um, my guess is about 10 years ago. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, very, very interesting question here. Um, you know, currently it, it says uh, currently bottled water is not regulated. Will bottled drinking water be included in the upcoming regulation? Or I guess kind of a, a corollary to that, do we find PFAS in bottled water? Uh, I guess I'll take that one as well since it's focused on drinking water. Um, the answer to the first question is no. Bottled water, ironically enough, is not considered drinking water. It's considered a food substance. Um, so it's uh, regulated by the Food and Drug Administration as opposed to the, the EPA and our existing drinking water regulations. So it's a completely separate paradigm. I'm not aware of any regulation within the bottled water industry that speaks to uh, an acceptable level of PFAS in bottled water. And yes, you do find um, levels of PFAS in bottled water that vary by brand. And in fact, I think the Environmental Working Group may, if you poke through their website a little bit, may have some uh, results from various bottled water uh, brand testing. Now, I caution you to take away that, you know, brand X is terrible because that's the one they sampled, but I would expect a pretty high variability in the various bottled water brands, even within one brand. So just because they collected and analyzed one sample doesn't mean that one brand is safe or is not safe. Um, it just, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's an illustration of, yes, we find those compounds there too. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, does, does, does distilling water remove PFAS? I, I guess I'll take that one too, since it's, I think it's related to drinking water. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the process of distillation is basically heating water to the point that it forms a vapor and then you condense it somewhere else and the PFAS would not, uh, does not have that kind of a vapor pressure. It would stay in the, in the dregs that remain um, and not be in the distillation process. However, that does not mean that water that's sold as distilled at the grocery store won't have PFAS in it because um, you, what is the bottle made of that you stored that uh, stored that water in after it went underwent its distillation process? What other equipment was it in contact with? Uh, likely there were some PFAS containing um, items that it came into contact with. So you know, there that just because it's distilled doesn't mean it doesn't necessarily have PFAS in it. Okay. Great. Uh, now, this next question, we've got a, a couple have asked a similar type of question. Uh, once the granulated, granulated activated carbon is no longer effective, how is that disposed of and, and what, what is done with, with that extra, that charcoal that activated uh, carbon? Um, I can answer that one. This is Julia. So I, I tried to present this a little bit in one of the slides, but once the GAC is spent, uh, you might want to try to uh, degrade the PFAS that's absorbed to it. So you can, right now, send it to an incinerator, although I think that um, incinerators that are accepting PFAS-laden materials kind of fluctuate. There may only be one in the United States that um, is accepting materials at this time. 
And there have been con some concerns recently from the EPA that incineration might not be a very effective strategy for treating PFAS laden GAC. So my understanding, which Ava can elaborate on from personal experience perhaps, is that the other option is to landfill the absorbed GAC. Um, and then again, you worry about PFAS leaching um, in the landfill. Okay. All right. Uh, kind of tied in with that, uh, there was a question dealing with um, uh, you know, one of the things that, that we've kind of been looking at from an NRCS standpoint, I believe, uh, with, with the uh, LPELC group as well, of the generation of biochars. Uh, do you know if, if biochar, uh, whether activated or not activated, could, could also be worked or could be utilized as, as a PFOS uh, uh, removal uh, medium? This is Ava. I can speak to that a little bit. Um, the uh, there's active research going on on that uh, exact question. Um, uh, Professor Chris Higgins at the Colorado School of Mines is leading some projects looking at biochar treatment of PFAS. Um, and you know the the results are you know there there are two ways to look at the results. One way is to say well biochar is not as effective as granular activated carbon in removing PFAS. And if you look at it on a gram per gram of media basis, that's certainly true. But the whole point of biochar is that it's a readily available and very economical uh, form of potential treatment or sorbent for a number of contaminants. And so from an economic perspective, it may yet make sense to apply biochar in some PFAS uh, treatment applications. You know, for example, stormwater runoff issues um, you know, we, when you need it in really large quantities, uh, or GAC is just not cost effective, biochar may be an effective solution. Yeah, that, that, that kind of ties in with, with, with another question here. You know, we, we do a lot of, um, uh, at least with our agency, we deal with a lot of individuals that irrigate, um, you know, cropland. So is, is that a possible a viable alternative, I guess, of, of, because we're talking about, you know, millions of gallons of water. Uh, would, would that be something worth uh, uh, be worth looking at, or or is it diluted enough? I guess in in most cases that it's really not a concern when you're you're dealing with with irrigation. So I would say irrigation at millions of gallons per day is very similar to uh, utility level water treatment at millions of gallons per day. Um, so I would say when you're talking about many millions of gallons per day, you really have to take a hard look at the economics and what falls out of that kind of analysis is typically a granular activated carbon or ion exchange solution. A lot of the technologies that Julia was uh, talking about are, are much more technologically advanced. They treat, they're designed to treat much smaller flows at a much higher cost per gallon treated, uh, which may be the best solution for a remediation application where the flows are typically very small. Um, but if you're talking about, you know, municipal uh, level flows or even irrigation level flows, um, you, we're really kind of headed towards the direction of GAC ion exchange. Biochar may have an application there. Um, I think it just depends on what, um, what, where you're starting and where you need to get as far as PFAS and, and other contamination. I haven't seen it in a kind of a truly engineered form where you would have it in a treatment plant, for example. I've only seen it in the context of environmental application. So, you know, maybe as a soil amendment rather than a, you know, an engineered treat treatment process. Sure. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, I know that this is probably a question a lot of people thought about since since we said that, you know, PFOS is, is basically everywhere and it affects everybody. You know, are there some home treatment uh, methods for you know homeowners with with uh, let's say they had their own well uh, of, of treating PFOS? So, I, I, Julie, I don't know if you want to speak to this topic. I don't want to hog the hog the Q and A completely. So, uh, I want no to give you a chance. Yeah. Um, I think that a couple of things that I know of, um, we had in North Carolina um, some home treatments that were put in place by the Camorras facility, which was implicated in uh, JetX spills into the Cape Fear River. And my understanding there is that. Um, 
You can use like inline filtration systems in your home that are also typically activated carbon or some sort of ion exchange resin based um, that you can put in line in your in your own like home water use to treat water that way. And I know that in North Carolina, at least Tim Morris was responsible, I think, in part for um, for installing some of those systems. And maybe right. Ava has another comment on there. I, I can build on that a little bit, and I, I just to confirm um, what you're saying, Julia, which is that you know at the at the point of use we call it point of use in our industry, but it's, you know at the homeowner level, um, we you can apply exactly those three technologies that I discussed at the utility level, and and that's not always the case. It it so happens that there are consumer grade versions of activated carbon filters, of ion exchange units, and of uh, reverse osmosis system. Um, and I would argue, even though I'm not a big fan of a reverse osmosis system for a individual homeowner use because it's incredibly wasteful of water, uh, what the homeowner doesn't know is that they only get a very, very small fraction of the total water used to create water out of an RO system that lives under your sink. But for a drinking contamination um, uh, challenge where you have legitimate concerns about a well, well water quality, you may consider installing a system like that at the tap that you're going to drink out of. You know, don't install it on your whole home. You don't need it for your shower water. Um, but for one or two maybe taps that you get your actual drinking water out of, the RO system, base system is probably the most effective for um, PFAS removal. Very good. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, we're, we're, we're at the, the bottom of the hour, but I do have this, this, this question I wanted to ask you because I think it's, it's a very, uh, I think it's a pertinent question. Uh, it's talking about looking at the map where PFOS can be found. So there are several states that have a very high density of drinking water issues. Why is that the case for those, those states and not others? Yeah, I can speak to North Carolina, at least, I think, which is one of the maps that has a lot of dots on there. Um, so my understanding is that there is some regional kind of component to where certain PFAS were manufactured. Um, North Carolina has a lot of uh, industry and I think is dealing with a lot of legacy contamination from, from those industries. As we mentioned, PFAS materials are put into a variety of consumer products and if production facilities were housed in those states, then it's likely that there was some uh, contamination before these regulations kind of caught up. So I think that that's the case in places like North Carolina and Minnesota and maybe in the, um, the Ohio State area. Um, I'll also comment that the, uh, the North Carolina PFAS testing network, um, PFAST, I believe, for another acronym, uh, is also doing really extensive monitoring and testing. So it can also be that there is just a lot of monitoring going on in the area, and so a lot of dots are appearing. So uh, with that, again, I want to thank both uh, Dr. Ava Steinley darling and also Dr. Julia Darcy for a tremendous amount of information. This has been so helpful. Uh, again, I think we've just touched the surface of, of this whole issue. Uh, I know for our agency, it's just now becoming uh, something to think about, but I think it's going to be, the need is going to grow. We're going to see much, much more of this. So again, thank you very much for, for the presentation that you made today.